All right, here we go with part two of our uh, unit three review for the uh, unit three exam. So um, we're going to keep going where we left off. We're looking at writers. So there's two kind of like famous writers during this time period. One is, of course, Ibn Battuta. The other is Marco Polo. And their travels, remember, they went very far distances. Uh, Marco Polo went from the Mediterranean across Asia and back. Uh, even Batuta traveled even further. He went into parts of uh, Africa, parts of Southeast Asia, uh, and everywhere in between. So uh, what these two travelers show us is that one, long distance trade was possible. Uh, two, it was possible uh, thanks to the political stability. So even Batuta was able to travel mainly because he was a Muslim and he traveled from one Muslim place to the next. Uh, while uh, Marco Polo traveled, you know, during the time of Pax Mangalica when the Mongols ruled over everywhere. So it shows us that uh, long distance travel was possible, that it was made possible by political stability, um, and that the introduction to these new places and these new people uh, oftentimes left not conflicts but issues. Uh, it led to issues. Uh, and that deals with limitations of intercultural knowledge, meaning that people were kind of like ignorant about other cultures. And it makes sense because obviously these, you know, one society uh, has very little uh, knowledge about another society thousands of miles away. Uh, and the kind of the most common brought up example is that of Ibn Battuta's criticisms on sub-Saharan Muslims. Remember, he criticized the sub-Saharan Muslims of, uh, of Mali uh, for not being too strict, or not being strict enough, I should say, on uh, the social and, uh, you know, attire, dress attire restrictions that women should have, Muslim women should have, in that they should be covered and that they shouldn't be able to openly uh, interact with males that are not part of their family. And that shows us again um, that they that he misunderstood or, or didn't quite fully understand, uh, you know, African society, right, and African values of being matrilineal and stuff like that. On the other hand, we see that this, you know, these writings also show us um, how people can, you know, slowly start gaining interest. And Marco Polo's writings, of course, will gain uh, popularity in Europe. And um, uh, it will increase Europe's interest in finding out more about the East, right? Finding more about Asia, uh, India, China, and Southeast Asia, or what they call the Indies. Um, so the, um, or the Far East. So there's limitations and there's also increased extent, right? Like more, more knowledge of people wanting to find out about faraway lands. Now, um, as trade increase and there's more interaction, we're going to see diffusion take place uh, in cultures, right? Uh, so, for example, uh, in during the time of the Song period of China, we're going to see how Neo-Confucianism, during the Song period specifically, how Neo-Confucianism and Buddhism is going to spread from China uh, to Korea and to Japan and even to parts of Vietnam. And they're going to spread because of that close interaction that whether through conflict or through trade that uh, China had with these other smaller East Asian countries. Uh, we're going to see the same interaction take place between India, South Asia, uh, and Southeast Asia, places like Funan and Angkor, right, where we see Hinduism and Buddhism be adopted and be spread there uh, and become a major religion there, especially in architecture. We see a lot of architecture in Southeast Asia. Uh, this is the famous Buddhist temple called Angkor Wat in modern-day Cambodia uh, in the kingdom of Ang it used to be the kingdom of Angkor. And again, this is a Buddhist temple, but the towers that you see here are decorated with the statues of Hindu gods. So we see the blending of Buddhism and Hinduism. They both have originated in India. Uh, and when they arrive in Southeast Asia, we see the adoption of these religions and the adoption of these architectural styles. 
Uh, other examples is the development of Islamic mosques, the construction of mosques. Right? We see them in West Africa, in Ghana, in Mali. We see them in East Africa, in um, the Swahili city states. We see them in India. We see them in Southeast Asia, right? So wherever Islam spread through trade or conflict, uh, the knowledge of you know building mosques and the Arabic language and the Arabic knowledge all the you know golden age of Islam, uh, all that went with her, went with them. And finally, we see how uh, when it comes to architecture and writing, uh, we see continuity in Mesoamerica with the Mayan and the Olmec writing and architecture, kind of passed down to the next generation, which is the Aztecs. All right, uh, next, next, we also see other examples of cross-cultural diffusion, right? Uh, when it comes to science and technology, right? Uh, famous examples include how the Muslims, how they took the other math, knowledge of geometry and algebra and Arabic numerals, right? All the math that the Greeks and the Indians, the Gupta Indians had developed in the previous time period. Now the Muslims are gaining those that knowledge and expanding on it, working on it and understanding it better understanding astronomy better, engineering better than ever before. We also see how the Muslims uh, adopted Greek philosophy and science, medicine, right? And how they uh, preserved it by writing it down, right? And this, of course, during the time where Europe is in the, in the dark ages, so there's not gonna be a lot of writing in Europe, right? The one exception, of course, would be Al-Andalus or Muslim Spain which is under Muslim control and therefore it is not uh, under the you know cultural darkness that the rest of Western Europe would have been. But the Muslims help conserve and expand Greek philosophy, right? They love the Aristotle and Plato. Uh, and they love the sciences, the math and the chemistry and the you know biology and the medicine. And they expand on that. So you see old traditions of learning right, from the previous time period, from the classical era, uh, are going to grow and expand and continue during this time period. We see the, uh, the development of the printing press, right, during the Tang Dynasty. We see how the, the impact of the printing press is going to have uh, on Chinese literacy rates, right, more and more people are going to be able to be educated. Same thing is going to happen in Europe, same thing is going to happen in the Middle East, in the Islamic Caliphate, right? And that technology of paper making and printing, you know, travels, it spreads uh, from the East to the West, right? From China across Central Asia into the Middle East, into the Mediterranean and into Europe. And the other famous example, of course, is gunpowder. And it travels the same way as paper, right? It goes from China, spreads across Central Asia, makes its way to the Islamic heartlands, right? The Islamic Caliphate. Islamic Empire before it finally ends up in Europe. Uh, so again, here we see Al Andalus, here we see uh, Islamic writing, Arabic writings, right, copying the Greeks, uh, paper and printing, right, the Europeans are going to make great use of this, all right, especially in time period four uh, and early gunpowder. Now, besides um, Besides, you know, knowledge and culture, we see uh, agriculture and food uh, spread as well. So we see banana spread, right? Uh, they are going to be adopted by the Bantus, and uh, they're going to be originally they're going to be introduced into Africa by uh, sailors from Southeast Asia, right? Those Austronesians we've talked about before. Well, most of the Austronesians went throughout Oceania, but some of them actually sailed to Madagascar and they brought bananas with them and they helped spread bananas throughout uh, Africa, eventually coming into contact with the Bantus. Um, so we see bananas become a major part of Sub-Saharan African diet. Uh, and it is because they were introduced by these outsiders, these foreigners from Oceania. Uh, we see probably the most important one is champa rice. Right, that fast ripening rice, right? Originally came from Southeast Asia, from Vietnam, uh, but it spread its way into into China, into East Asia, um, 
and uh, increase the population of those areas rapidly. Uh, other crops we see is cotton, uh, sugar, and citrus. And uh, sugar and, and, and cotton are going to have a major impact. They're going to come from India. They're going to grow popular in you know, the Islamic Caliphate, in Dar al-Islam. Uh, they're going to make their way into the Mediterranean. And wherever cotton and sugar go, so will slavery. And they're going to be um, they're going to be cultivated by slaves, right, on large plantations. So here you see some of those crops we were talking about. Uh, diseases also spread during this time uh, through war and through trade, like everything else. Uh, the most famous example, of course, is the Black Death or the bubonic plague. Again, it starts in China in the east, spreads across Central Asia, spreads across uh, to the Middle East, it spreads across to the Mediterranean and into Europe, uh, and it spreads through the trade networks of the Silk Road and the Mediterranean, and it spreads primarily thanks to the Mongols, right, during that increased amount of trade and travel that we saw during Pax Mongolica. Right, here we see the bubonic plague. All right, uh, next we are looking at our major states, right? So these are all the major states of the of the, um, the post-classical era. All right, some of the major cities. All right, so we have Novgorod up here in Russia. We have Venice here in Italy. We have Cahokia in the central United States. We have Tenochtitlan in with the Aztecs. We have um, Timbuktu in Ghana, right? Calicut in India, Malacca, Southeast Asia, right? Baghdad right here in the middle of the you know Islamic Empire. So all these new states, new empires, new everything uh, is going to be established during this time period. So what we see is that some of the post-classical empires are going to build on their legacy from the classical empires, but they're also going to add something new in their method of, um, of kind of like running their country. So for example, the Sui, the Tang, and the Song dynasties of China, which are the post-classical dynasties, right? They're going to continue having dynastic rule, they're going to continue using the mandate of heaven, right? Claiming that they have been chosen by the gods, by heaven, right? And of course, this is a continuation of what the Han dynasty had done in the previous time period, right? Being the classical era. But one thing that these dynasties do that the Han or the Qin or any of the classical or, you know, earlier dynasties didn't do is that they use the tribute system, right? So they're using the old system, the old ways of doing things, of legitimizing the power and the authority of the ruler of the state. But at the same time, they bring something new, right? Because they have different circumstances, they have different issues, they have different neighbors, they have different problems, and they have to figure out a way of how to solve it. So they're blending old ways with new inventions, right? old and new. The same thing happens with the Byzantine Empire. All right, so here we see Imperial China. All right, the Byzantine Empire. All right, at one point they ruled most of the Mediterranean just like the original Roman Empire had done at one point, right, before they lost it all. But the Byzantine Empire, they're going to continue Roman using Roman laws. They're going to continue using Roman culture. Uh, especially the use of Christianity. They're going to use uh, the idea that the emperor is both, you know, political and religious leader, right? This idea of Cesaro Papism, the binding chosen, right? So they're going to use the old Roman ways of doing things and um, legitimizing their power, um, just like the Romans had done. But they're also going to introduce a new idea, called the theme system, right? Remember the theme system is 
when the military uh, offers land to peasants in return for military service, right? So if you're a peasant in the Byzantine Empire and you fight for a couple of years, uh, then you're going to be given land and you're going to be this independent peasant instead of being like a serf working for someone else forever. Uh, you'll be your own landowner. So the theme system is this new kind of concept that the Byzantines come up with. And they need this because they're always in need of military, because they're always under attack, because they're in the center. They're literally like in the center of these, you know, of the north and the south and the east and the west, right? All these different people are, are always under, uh, uh, you know, trying to attack the Byzantines. So they're always going to need a large army, right? And the theme system is going to supply them that large army. So, again, these ideas, right, so the old concepts are going to be reused and new concepts are going to be established. Now, in some places, particularly Islamic places, right, we're going to see brand new systems come up, right? Uh, so the idea of the caliphate, right, ruled by a caliph who is the successor of Muhammad, right, the prophet Muhammad. Right, the caliphates, whether it's the Umayyads or the Abbasids or Al Andalus in Spain, um, that's a new concept that didn't exist before. Right, that the leader is uh, the successor of Muhammad. He's not divinely chosen, but he's important, and he's political and religious leader. Uh, we see the sultanates in uh, Delhi. That's a new type of government that didn't exist before. We see the Khanates. Right, the, especially the Ilkhanate of Persia, right, which is the Muslim one, uh, or the Golden Horde of Russia, that's another Khanate. We see the East Coast, um, East African city-states, the Swahili states, right? Uh, we see Melaka, that Southeast Asian uh, city-state, right, which is also Muslim, right, modern-day Indonesia. We see the Sudanic Empire, Ghana and Mali in West Africa. So these are new governments, and they're all going to be new states. And they're all going to legitimize their power through religion, this new religion that develops during this time period, which is, of course, Islam. All right. Um, so that is going to be new, completely new, uh, with uh, new in the sense that it's a new religion during this time period. But the idea of using religion to legitimize someone's power and authority, that's been around since the beginning of civilizations. As right, so we see the Islamic Empire, right, conquering uh, from Spain to Persia, right, all the way to the Indus Valley. Of course, this is the symbol of Muhammad. We don't show the picture because, remember, under Islamic belief, uh, showing images of religious icons, religious individuals, is uh, considered wrong. Uh, this is the Alhambra, right? The huge palace built in um, in Spain by the Muslims, right? With Muslim architecture, the Mongol Empire, right? The Khanates, right? Those are new territories that were developed, um, founded by Genghis Khan. Of course, the main successor is going to be Kublai Khan, who ruled over China uh, during East Asia. Uh, during the Yuan Dynasty. Uh, here we see the African kingdoms, right? Ghana and Mali. Uh, towards the end of this time period, there's another one called Songhai, uh, but we won't have to worry about them until later on. Uh, don't forget also, there's always the exception, that's Aksum, modern day Ethiopia. Uh, Aksum is going to be the Christian kingdom in Africa, where all the other kingdoms are going to convert to Islam. Aksum is going to remain, uh, is going to remain Christian. The Sahili city-states, right, all along the East Coast, Great Zimbabwe and Southern Africa, right, and of course all these arrows, these are the um, Bantu migrations, Trans-Saharan trade network, uh, going across the Trans-Sahara network, uh, Sahara Desert, right, that central trade network city, of course, is Timbuktu. Uh, here's a picture of the remains of Great Zimbabwe. Remember, they're unique because like the uh, Incas, they, they're stone structures, they don't have mortar, they don't have that cement paste that goes between the stones. Uh, don't forget that in India we have the Sultanate of Delhi, 
which united northern India, but not southern India. Southern India remained independent and decentralized. Um, so a lot of these new states that we are seeing in the post-classical era, they're going to many times adopt the local traditions that already exist there. Uh, so for example, in the Islamic Caliphate, when they conquer Persia, they're going to use Persians to be part of their administration, part of their bureaucracy. And that's because Persians have always had this long history going back to the first Achaemenid Persian Empire, um, you know, back with Cyrus the Great and stuff, of being really good administrators. Right? And just like how the, uh, the, the Chinese, the Yuan dynasty, they, they also used the Persians uh, for their administration needs. Uh, we also see how um, how Japan is going to adopt parts of Neo-Confucianism and parts of Buddhism um, into their own government. Like they create their capital based on the Chinese capital. They try to mimic the civil service exam. Um, so a lot of when these you know new ideas are brought in, many times they're like implemented or they're adopted, but partially, not fully. Right, uh, Chinese Buddhism will be mixed in with um, with uh, Shinto, right, which is the Japanese religion. And here we see, of course, media with Japan, and Japan is going to remain um, is going to remain pretty much decentralized throughout most of this time period, um, even under the rule of the shogunate. Uh, they're still going to remain pretty decentralized. Uh, in the Americas, we see that the states, the empires, are going to grow larger than ever before. Uh, by the one, by the year like one thousand, we see that you know that's the collapse, the fall of the Mayan city states. So for like the first half of the post-classical era, from six hundred to one thousand, the Mayans are going to be you know flourishing. And they're going to have all these city states in uh, Mesoamerica or in the Yucatan Peninsula. Until eventually their environment uh, is damaged and they kind of have to abandon their cities. Uh, in North America, we see the construction of Cahokia, right, which is the largest city in in the United States, uh, and it was built by the mound builders, right, the Mississippian people, uh, and it was a trade center as well. Uh, and in towards the end of this time period, in the out in 1400s we see the Aztecs and the Inca empires form. And of the two, the Inca is the much larger one, right? Uh, the Incas, you know, their capital is Cusco, right? And they're gonna control this huge territory along the Pacific coast or the West coast of South America. Um, and they're gonna have to construct all those roads, right? Uh, in order to maintain um, centralized authority. The um, the Aztecs, right, their territories, right, is going to be right in the central part of Mexico or Mesoamerica uh, with their capital of Tenochtitlan. Uh, and their territory, their, their empire is going to be much smaller, uh, but all the surrounding areas are going to be under Aztec tributary control, right? Um, one last thing we're going to talk about is the importance of paper and printing. We mentioned this already, but remember, Paper and printing comes from Tang, China. It spreads to the Abbasid Caliphate, and from there it goes to the Mediterranean. Right, the arrival and the use of paper and printing reduces the cost of books, which allows more people to read, allows more people to get an education, and change their status. Right, we see this in, especially in China, with the civil service exam. But later on, we see it in Europe, where people are now going to be educated uh, and become, you know, independent, um, you know, uh, like business owners or merchants, because now they know how to read and write and keep, you know, books. All right, uh, so I'm going to stop here for part two. Thank you for bearing with me. If you haven't figured it out, I'm very sick. So thank you for this lovely Christmas present. You guys got me sick. I blame all of you. This sucks. <laughs>